Good afternoon. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming uh, for this session, which is a very exciting session with a lot of insights, incredible uh, findings, and uh, to be honest, innovative ways that we have to think about how to engage uh, in science uh, with the community and really to not uh, engage the community in a tokenistic way, but really in a more innovative way. So we're really excited to have you coming here. Uh, it's lunchtime, but taking your time to be here uh, and really excited to have many brains and insights and people who are working with the community for this session. So my name is Prince Bahati. I'm going to be a co-chair for this meeting. I work with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And I'm Kawango Egot. Oops. Kawango Egot. I work with Impact Research based in Kenya. Yeah. Because this session is going to be very tight. Uh, we have five minutes for presentation. We're going to invite all the presenters to present and really do the community way. Leave about 30 minutes for us to interact. Uh, <laughs> if that's OK with all of us, uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Emily Evans. Uh, Emily Evans is, uh, works with FHI 360. I think she doesn't need any further introduction. She has 18 years of experience in the design and implementation of health research and applying research results to improve health programs in low and middle income countries. She's a scientist in the Health Services Research Division of FHI 360 and I've really had the privilege of knowing her over probably five, ten years in between and it's really exciting to hear uh, from Emily on the process as product implementing participatory right-based <laughs> research with female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and transgender women in research. So, Emily, take it away. Thank you very much, Prince and Kowango. I'm Emily Evans, and I'd like to share the results of a study conducted by the United Nations Development Program and the Linkages Project. Linkages is the USAID and PEPFAR flagship project for addressing HIV. HIV prevention, care, and treatment among key populations. So I want to begin by thanking the female sex workers, the men who have sex with men, and the trans women who participated in this study and courageously shared their experiences with us. And we'd also like to thank the peer interviewers who, who collected the data and the civil society organizations who supported this work. So the study was a partnership between UNDP, Linkages, the University of the West Indies HIV AIDS Response Program, and over 20 global, national, and local key population-led organizations. And we collaborated to conduct participatory rights-based research on key populations' experiences of violence and its connections with HIV risk and service-seeking behavior in El Salvador, Trinidad and Tobago, Haiti, and Barbados. So addressing the HIV prevention needs of key populations requires new approaches to research. Previous approaches have triggered concerns about human rights violations, data ownership, and unacceptable study questions and study methodologies. Meaningful engagement of key populations in research design and implementation can address these issues and produce high quality applicable findings, but what does meaningful engagement look like and how is it fostered? So to answer these questions, we use participatory and rights-based research. So participatory research aims to involve those traditionally seen as subjects in the generation, validation, and use of knowledge, and creates a partnership between social groups and the scientific community to yield information that is more legitimate and more useful for social change. By rights-based research, we mean recognizing that MSM, transgender women, and female sex workers have the right to the most attainable standard of health and equal protection under the law. So how did we do this work? Key populations organizations provided input on the study populations, the interview topics, the recruitment, how to keep participants safe, the study instruments, and the analysis and the use of the data. All the data collectors were key population members, and they were supported by researchers in each country. Data collectors were trained in qualitative research, in interviewing skills, in speaking to victims of violence, in studies procedures, and in research ethics. And the study participants were recruited from key population-focused civil society organizations. We talked to a total of 178 people, and we administered structured qualitative interviews. 
to facilitate the collaboration between the regional and the national and the global actors and ensure that people were prepared to translate these results into action, the study team also formed advisory groups to discuss the content and the procedures of the data collection. And then following data collection and preliminary analyses, we held interpretation meetings in each country to review the data, ensure that it was interpreted accurately, prioritize results, and discuss dissemination plans. So I'd like to share just a few of the strategies we used to um, go through this process. The rest are on the poster. Please come and look. So first of all, we collaborated with KPOP members to define and reach study populations. Early on in the study process, MSM groups advised us to increase the sample size in each country to ensure that it reflected the educational and occupational diversity of gay men in MSM. And the study team worked closely with trans women in Haiti to ensure that the eligibility screening questionnaire could appropriately identify trans women in areas where their gender expression was often censored due to violence. So we used a two-stage question that asked with peop about people's gender identity as well as the sex assigned at birth. And then we worked further with local K-pops organizations to ensure that the terminology that we used in Creole was acceptable locally. Another approach that we used was supported capacity building to ensure that key populations had a strong voice in the process. And we did this by adapting training for varying levels of literacy by supporting data collectors to obtain research ethics training certification that then could be used for other research activities, and by on-the-job mentoring of peer data collectors by experienced researchers to ensure that the, high the research was high quality and people were learning and obtaining real skills. So I want to talk very briefly about what this result has yielded. So what did we get from using this participatory and rights-based research? So we've led, it's led to several activities to prevent and respond to violence against key populations. Linkages has developed guidance for collaborating with civil society, law enforcement, healthcare, to create an environment in which key population members understand their rights and can seek support from police, from peers, from healthcare workers. UNDP has shared these results with stakeholders, including other UN agencies, to advocate for attention to gender-based violence against key populations, and they've advocated for evidence-based legislation and public policies to promote the rights and inclusion of LGBTI populations in Latin America and the Caribbean. So in a final word, this work could not have been possible without a participatory and rights-based approach. By adopting this approach, we were able to recruit people, especially hard to reach populations, hidden populations. We were able to get richer data because people felt comfortable talking to their peers. And we were able to bring together groups that aren't often brought together to validate and interpret results that are now being used to help understand key populations' experiences and improve their health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily, for that excellent uh, presentation and for keeping to time. Uh, we look forward to the discussions and around uh, some of the outcomes and how you measure those outcomes. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, um, now Dr. Musonda Simwinga, who is a senior social scientist with a research degree PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he has over 20 years, 10 years experience conducting research in TB and high HIV in uh, high burden settings as social scientists as well as community engagement expert. It's really my pleasure to welcome you and share your thank experience. Thank you, thank you. Um, oh, I'm just trying to just to click on. So. Oh, right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tila Mainga, and I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Simwinga, who unfortunately could not be with us today. But in the room, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Bond and Dr. Ailes, who have also um, contributed quite a lot to this study. Um, so for, um, this poster is looking at adolescents and young people participation and representation in clinical trials, and we'll be drawing on lessons from um, a community-based wide HIV testing and treatment study um, HPTN 071, also known as POPART, which I'll speak to about in the next slide. So engagement of youth and um, adolescents in clinical trials is still something that is poorly studied or poorly understood, especially in the African um, context. And this, this um, poster is basically going to look at avenues which we use to engage them um, and also the challenges that um, we faced in facilitating their participation. 
Um, so the pop-up study was done in 21 communities in Zambia and South Africa, 12 in Zambia and 9 in South Africa. It was a huge randomized, or is a huge randomized control trial, um, and within it there's, uh, there was a party study which stands for pop Out for Youth. And the main aim of the pop up study was to um, look at the uptake of HIV um, testing and counseling and testing um, amongst adolescents uh, with, um, with the main focus of those aged 15 to 19 years old. And this study provided a platform for us to actually collect data um, and we did so using um, focus group discussions, uh, 18 focus group um, discussions. So in terms of participation avenues, there are several that we use. The most common or the most popular was the Adolescent Community Advisory Boards, um, also known as ACABs, and these held meetings once a month. And in those meetings, um, adolescents had the opportunity to interact with um, study implementers, ask questions, get updates on what is happening within the study, and it also provided a platform where um, adolescents got sexual um, reproductive training. Future Spaces was an avenue that was used in South Africa particularly. These were just um, spaces within the community, safe spaces within the community, where adolescents and youth could meet up, network, and um, uh, discuss about sexual reproductive health. Um, social media was also very um, uh, useful. Um, Facebook was particularly useful in South Africa while WhatsApp was more common, or was more um, used in Zambia. Other avenues of participation include, included youth-friendly health services, community health events, and regular meetings with researchers. And within these meetings, youth got the opportunity to help or give their input on reviewing study material. So I think this is a lovely picture that is looking at a young person being enrolled in the study and it was um, during, <laughs> during a community health event. So um, some factors that facilitated participation in the study included training and skills building, financial and non-financial incentives. The non-financial incentives are the ones that I spoke about in the previous slide, such as training and um, opportunity to network and also just acknowledging the role that youth and adolescents play. So just letting them know that you are heard and we do see you and appreciate your participation in the trial. Um, support from parents and guardians was also um, very helpful. And in addition, since we're dealing with a young population, it was quite necessary to have activities that got them excited. So plays, uh, dramas, um, and dance activities. So this is another lovely picture that is looking at um, a group discussion during an ACAB meeting. So there were also constraints that, we, that came up um, that constrained um, youth from participating in clinical trials. One of them was lack of money and incentives, which are sometimes um, termed as wasting time. So I'll just quickly read this, um, um, this quote. We know that this is voluntary, but even a little help will go a long way. This is why people are leaving and going to look for other means of earning money. They have no motivation to stay. Alcohol and substance abuse is also something that was mentioned and safety concerns when conducting study activities. Here's another lovely activity. This is one that's looking at a community health event. Um, as you can see, there's someone dancing in the pop-up uniform over there and it's drawn a large crowd and the, um, there's music that's being played in the background. So in conclusion, adolescents and youth in Africa are capable of participating in meaningful research that directly impacts their lives. While challenges in participation in research exist, um, we would love to encourage researchers to invest in meaningful partnerships with adolescents and youth. Um, what we found was that CABs um, that are mainly constitution, constituted of adolescent and youth representatives were a very helpful strategy. Um, thank you um, and would like to acknowledge our funders, um, our study team leaders and most importantly our participants. And thank you very much for really elaborating the factors that facilitate, but also those that could constrain our participation in research. Uh, my name is Kawango Agotawa. I come from Kenya. Um, we are going to have the last three presentations, and uh, the focus is shifting a little bit from uh, 
the individual experiences where we've learned about nothing for us without us, issues around empowerment through training of adolescents and young people. We've talked about uh, adolescent curb and, and so on. And right now we are moving on to the bigger picture. And uh, to start us off, we have uh, Suzanne Day, uh, who's going to talk to us about stakeholder engagement in HIV clinical trials, a systematic review of the evidence. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm here today to tell you about um, the systematic review that our group at the University of North Carolina conducted uh, on the topic of stakeholder engagement for HIV clinical trials. And we define stakeholder engagement as input by individuals or groups with an interest in HIV clinical trials in order to inform the conduct or design of said trials. And despite its value, stakeholder engagement has, specifically for the context of HIV clinical trials, has not been rigorously evaluated. Um, so the purpose of our systematic review was really to describe this kind of stakeholder engagement in a more thorough way and to compare this engagement to the recommendations established um, in the Good Participatory Practice Guidelines, which were developed jointly in 2011 by UNAIDS and AVAC. So um, our search strategy involves uh, using combinations of the terms HIV and clinical trials, uh, along with um, various synonyms for the term stakeholder engagement. Um, we searched four databases, so PubMed, Ovid, Cyanol, and Web of Science, as well as six high-impact HIV AIDS journals. And we supplemented this search strategy um, with hand searching of reference lists, as well as consultation with uh, experts in the field. So two reviewers independently assessed all titles, abstracts, and full text um, for including articles on the basis of the following inclusion criteria. So we were looking for articles that describe undertaking stakeholder engagement for the purpose of informing some aspects, any aspect at all, of an HIV clinical trial. And importantly, we didn't limit ourselves in terms of the types of HIV trials that we were looking at. Um, it could be a behavioral trial or a biomedical trial or related to HIV prevention or treatment. Um, and we extracted data on four key domains. So we were looking for the location of stakeholder engagement, which, which country was the engagement um, taking place in, um, the engagement method used by the study, the types of stakeholders who were engaged, and the purpose of stakeholder engagement. And for us, purpose referred to the answer to the question, um, what aspects of an HIV clinical trial was this engagement meant to inform? So we ended up uh, with 108 studies to include in our review. Uh, so I'll just present some of the highlights from our findings here. Uh, first of all, in terms of location, we found that more studies that were included in our review conducted engagement in high-income countries rather than middle and low-income countries. So um, about 44.4% of studies conducted engagement in high-income countries compared to 27.8% uh, in middle-income and just 8.3% in low-income countries. We also identified 14 different kinds of methods for conducting stakeholder engagements. Um, and the most frequently used methods we found were uh, what we call researcher-driven strategies. So namely stakeholder interviews and focus groups. Uh, in terms of the types of stakeholders engaged uh, throughout the studies, we found there was quite the broad range. It was a pretty diverse um, uh, range of representation. Interestingly, not only from HIV-affected community members, but also uh, broader stakeholders such as government officials and policymakers, healthcare workers, uh, and clinical trial researchers themselves, interestingly. Finally, when we analyzed the purpose for which engagement was conducted across the studies in our review, uh, we found that far more engagement was conducted to inform early clinical trial processes rather than later trial processes. So what we did was we charted this analysis out across the seven stages of clinical trial research, from research question development through to dissemination uh, in the post-trial period. And what we found, uh, as you can see here, is that 45% uh, of the studies in our review conducted engagement to inform uh, clinical trial protocol design, and 43.5% of the studies to inform trial recruitment. In contrast, uh, only about 3%, so 2.8% of the studies in our review um, conducted engagement to inform uh, results interpretations of the trial, and uh, just 10% to uh, inform dissemination processes. So uh, I think that our review concludes with the three suggestions really for future research and action. First of all, our findings suggest uh, that there may be a need for greater support for stakeholder engagement in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, we think also that future research should consider uh, using engagement methods that are more stakeholder-driven and participatory rather than researcher-driven. 
Uh, and finally, more research is needed on ways that we can involve stakeholders in the later stage processes of HIV clinical trials. Uh, so that's it for me. Please uh, come and check out our poster uh, that's hanging out there. And uh, just wanted to say many thanks to our team, our supporters, and our funders at the NIH. Thanks very much. So thank you, Suzanne. We're moving on to Gail Broder from the US. Oh, OK. <laughs> and, and she's going to talk to us uh, about uh, standardizing metrics for conduct of community engagement in HIV prevention research. Uh, Gail has worked for 15 plus years and 50 plus sites at looking at issues around uh, community education, uh, peer awareness and training and, and engagement in clinical trials, participant engagement and recruitment and so on. So you can share with us. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So you've heard a little bit about GPP already. Um, but what we noticed in our work is that to date, there aren't any standardized metrics that define its implementation or its evaluation. And so our team of authors who comprise the community engagement unit of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network sought to create a baseline by which one element of community engagement, the recruitment of participants for a study, could be evaluated. And we specifically were looking at the two antibody-mediated prevention, or AMP, studies that are currently underway. These are two proof of concept studies of a monoclonal broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV and testing to see whether the antibody is effective in preventing HIV infection. Um, in these two trials, one is enrolling 2,700 men, trans men, and trans women who have sex with men in the US, Bra Brazil, Peru, and Switzerland. And the second is enrolling 1,900 women in seven sub-Saharan African nations. So our team developed um, a set of recruitment descriptor uh, terms to describe the strategies being used to find and enroll participants for each of the two studies. These were vetted with our community working groups and revised based on the input that we received. And that, in, that input was really critical to characterizing the strategies that the recruiters were planning to use. Um, we needed to define common time points so that we could measure implementation in a common way across each of the study sites. And this became particularly important because each of the sites could develop its own process for how they elected to screen participants to determine their eligibility to be enrolled. And so across this wide set of sites, we had to come up with time points that could fairly um, measure each in common. Uh, we ultimately decided on the time point of when a volunteer gives their informed consent to be screened for enrollment. Um, our potential participants were asked at that time, how did you hear about the AMP study? And it was their answers to that question that formed our data set. The clinical research sites were reporting their data to our team, and we did the tabulation, monitored trends, and determined any areas where sites needed support or where there were successes that could be shared and replicated. The data that we're presenting are for an 11 month period, uh, January 1st to November 30th of last year. And while these studies are being jointly conducted by our network and the HIV Prevention Trials Network, the data that I'm presenting today are only for those sites that are affiliated with HVTN. So I'm hoping that you'll stop by the poster because the one thing that's a little difficult about slides is I can't really show you side-by-side -side comparisons of the regions very well. So here's the Western data and I'll show you the African data next. Um, all 29 of the global sites used a variety of recruitment strategies successfully, but they did vary in use by region. The most effective recruitment strategy across global sites was referrals with an efficiency ratio of 2.4 to 1 from screening to enrollment. The least effective was print materials and ads in the US and Switzerland at 5.8 to 1, and the internet was least efficient in Africa at 6 to 1. Sites generated a similar number of screening appointments using face-to-face -face outreach with 719 appointments in the Americas and Switzerland and 717 in Africa. But they represent strikingly different percentages of the total number of people who were actually screened 
accounting for 26% of screenings in the Americas and Switzerland and 50% in Africa, and also strikingly different percentages of the total enrollment, representing 29% in the Americas and Switzerland and 56% in Africa. The internet, interestingly, is the greatest difference between regions, with 43% of total enrollments in the West and less than 1% in Africa. What's still difficult for us to assess is the combined effects or synergies of having various recruitment strategies being used uh, at the same time during the same periods. The social science literature shows that people need to be exposed to a message six or more times before they decide to act upon it. And so, for example, while print materials may not have been highly efficient on their own, there may have been some benefit um, in raising awareness about the trial, even if ultimately someone decided to join the trial because of their interaction in a face-to-face -face setting with a recruiter or through an internet contact. It's also hard to know the impact of recall memory. And so when that volunteer was asked, how did you hear about the study? What was the strategy that they reported? And we don't know if that was the most recent one or one of many. The use of these standardized metrics really enabled us to perform some meaningful comparisons and to really understand uh, and support the decision to develop these metrics more fully to use them in future evaluation. Our outreach staff must use their, all of their available resources and their strategies for successful study recruitment, and they need to utilize data like this to assess their own efficiencies and where they have room to improve, and also to decide what's really working and what's not. Ensuring that sites have the resources to utilize a broad range of strategies will increase the likelihood of reaching the broadest audience and engaging the widest range of community stakeholders. We also believe that use of a wide range of strategies will capitalize on any synergies that may be happening. It's our belief that recruitment messages must be positioned in all places that may be seen by a volunteer, since we may ultimately, we don't know what will ultimately spark the decision to join a trial. It's critical that all of our sites for any studies have the support uh, to use a variety of strategies and to really be able to evaluate their own data and their own successes. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge all of our study sites that provided this data to us and collected it, our community working groups who gave us such valuable input about how to describe these strategies and how to measure them in time, and to all of my co-authors on our community engagement team, uh, one of whom is also here with me today. So we uh, look forward to questions, and we hope you'll stop by the poster so that you can better see the side-by-side -side comparisons. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Graham Brown, who is a senior research fellow at the Aust Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society in Melbourne. And uh, he's going to talk to us about GIPA in action, people living with HIV leadership and guidance in the development of a new PL HIV quality of life scale for community and policy sector. So the big picture, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I'd like to begin my presentation by thanking people living with HIV who have generously given their time, um, their lives, their experiences and their bodies to research throughout the epidemic, and that much of our fight against HIV relies on, on that contribution um, for, to, to putting themselves forward, and our fight against HIV is very much indebted. I'd also like to thank my fellow presenters for those amazing projects really setting the scene for the sorts of challenges we're working with. The greater involvement of people with HIV um, has been a foundation to the res effective responses to HIV. However, in research, and particularly quantitative research, this has often been limited to, co to really consultation rather than full collaboration, which brings me to the POSQUAL project. To improve the uh, evaluation of services and also enhance evidence for advocacy, HV organisations in Australia identified that we needed a short, empirically validated quality of life scale that could be easily incorporated into the reality of day-to-day -day, um, services and programs. Already available quality of life scales are generally very large, um, often at cost money, but the major problem was they were large and not practical within community and clinical settings. 
To respond to this challenge, we wanted to develop, we needed to develop a real partnership, um, a partnership of poetry of the organisations, researchers and health industry. We pulled, we pulled those areas together to pull resources and develop the PulseQual scale. Um, and one of the key things here was having peer organisations as co-investigators, not as just as, um, as being consulted. Um, so after two years... So the, what we developed was, after going through a whole range of process of two years of intense development and background work, prioritising various domains, coming up with about 100, 150 different items, and undertaking a national survey of 465 people with HIV to complete a survey about creating a survey, um, which is a pretty <laughs> no mean feat. Um, also, we could analyse the data and kind of work out the best, shortest number of items that would correlate well with much larger quality of life, stigma and resilience scales. Um, it's quite an achievement to go from 100 draft items down to just 13 items across four domains and have these achieve such a strong reliability and validity results. I won't go into de too much detail about the results, but in highly technical and statistical terms, the results were basically wow <laughs> and awesome. <laughs> so, how did we actually do that? One of the key factors that helped us achieve these results was the, the genuine embedding of, of people with HIV or GEPA principles in direct partnership with peer-led organisations. So what that meant was having peer organisations as co-investigators, having um, a major funder such as Vive Healthcare who understood GPA and the involvement of people with HIV, and having people with HIV involved in the conceptualisation of the study at the very beginning, the determining of what the domains for quality of life would be, um, the development of the items, promotion and engagement, but in particular being directly involved in key decisions of the final scale. In other words, being directly involved in the actual data analysis um, of, the, of the results. So what did that actually achieve? We contributed a much deeper understanding of the complexity of the experience of people living with HIV. It ensured, I think, a much deeper understanding, sorry, a much uh, a stronger balancing of statistical rigour with lived experience and practical use. It strengthened the relationship across research, community and industry. It also gave us the opportunity to be non-reliant on individuals with HIV. So, for example, having a researcher such as myself who happens to be living with HIV, that's not enough to tick meaningful involvement. I, as an individual, I don't have the breadth and, um, and on-the-ground knowledge of a rapidly changing community. One person does not mean GEPA. The POSQUAL scale is currently being field tested now by 15 community support and healthcare programs um, across Australia. Um, has been used in national surveys in Australia and also in the US and has even been translated into Spanish. Um, and we've recently found out that POSQUAL will be the quality of life indicator for the Australian National HIV Strategy. The development of POSQUAL has demonstrated the benefits of full collaboration to achieve high quality research outcomes. So I'd like to thank my community partners in this project, um, V for having the, the confidence to support a much more collaborative process, and in particular the 465 people with HIV who completed a survey in order to create a survey. Um, a true demonstration of the commitment of people with HIV to research. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Graham, for that, uh, and thank you for the wonderful conclusion. Uh, one person does not mean GIFA, and for the wow and awesome results. <laughs> so we're going to open it up for questions. Please uh, introduce yourself, uh, and uh, also, if possible, uh, tell us who the question is directed to. We have about 20 minutes of fruitful discussion, so we're really excited that uh, we achieved uh, to make sure our community experts can speak within five minutes, and we really thank you for that. It's not very easy, but let's open up for questions. Yeah, mic two. Hello. Can, we? can everyone hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Um, my name is Stefan Wallace. I'm with the Vaccine Trials Network. Um, thank you all for your presentations. 
uh, incredibly challenging to present that much information in five minutes, mm -hmm. um, but you did a great job. I am really happy that the session happened because um, I think it's really important to illustrate how community can be further engaged in programmatic as well as research um, advances. Um, so that said, I also wanted to comment because I heard at least once or twice, uh, one, that uh, participants were being described as subjects. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, for those on the panel as well as those in the room, uh, we can go forward from this space not using that language, mm -hmm. it's stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. Um, and we refer to folks as volunteers or participants. Mm -hmm. um, and people who participate in research are not subjects. They are not the focus. The subject is answering the research question. Um, so unless you're doing something negative to a study participant, which I hope you're not doing, um, then we should probably avoid using that language. Yeah. And the other thing is <laughs> that I think it's important that we stop using terms like hard to reach when describing communities. I know that that language is in the literature, and I know that many people have uh, <laughs> sort of advanced the way that's being described and discussed in the literature. But because a community is hard to reach to you, does not mean that it's hard to reach. Yeah. Um, the language is rooted in racism and white supremacy, um, and so we need to really stop using that language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Emily Bass. I work at AVAC. Um, I had the, the privilege um, to write with Kay Hankins and a few other people the first version of GPP, which um, is much improved. So if you want to hear everything that was wrong with it at the beginning, it, all the flaws are my fault, everything good about it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, no, this is in, I, it's extraordinary both um, as a research advocate and then as someone with a close tie to the document to sort of to see these presentations. So thank you for that, Anthea. I I, I don't know if the, we missed your slides, but I wanted to know a little bit about the research sites and the context that the kinds of research that were happening, um, or maybe it's in your poster, but just sort of where who poster. you were speaking to, if you're allowed to take the time for that. Um, and then Suzanne, I wondered if the, within the search terms you had any sense of how many of the papers, how many of the trials or the papers had actually used GPP per se versus engaging with stakeholder engagement. So we'll take two more questions and then we'll give the opportunity for the panel to respond. Um, uh, not really. Oh. Uh, not really a question, just a, a comment, I guess a, a, a perspective. My name's uh, Vic Perry from uh, Living Positive Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, and, and we're one of the organisations that works closely with the, the research that um, Graham's talking about. And I just want to talk about the, the quality of life, I guess, that, that in my work, and I'm the project worker, uh, uh, with this particular program called Phoenix Workshop uh, for Newly Diagnosed, that this is just, this research has been involved in recently, and I want to talk about the, the quality of life that's been increased in my work. So for the project worker involved, uh, it's enhanced uh, the satisfaction in my work to be able to know that the, the meaningful uh, participation that the people have um, and engage in the research and the results or the consequence uh, of the results of that research uh, means a lot to me too. So you know, my, sort of, it, it's increased that, that yeah. satisfaction Fantastic. knowing that this work is really meaningful and, and actually is producing uh, uh, results. Thank um, you. So I just wanted to say how important it is for, for the project much. worker yeah. involved. Okay. So we'll go to Maybe mic one. two and mic four and then okay. we'll take this. Go ahead, Mike. Too. Okay, I, I have just one question. As a person very much involved in CBPR uh, research in Germany with really stigmatized communities, I would like to know how do you measure the impact of participation, mm -hmm. or moreover, how uh, does the community define impact of participation? Because the expectation of the community mm -hmm. is completely different. They want to see changes in. Uh, they want to, sh yeah. to change oppressive white structures. Mm -hmm. They want to see uh, changes in societies. Yeah. For me, I have the data I can publish. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. very well-established scientist yeah. in Germany. I have my salaries. They receive incentives. Mm -hmm. How do we contribute yeah. to 
to this uh, to the changing oppressive structure yeah. in a very wide society, especially in Europe, mm -hmm. and how does uh, colonial history influences our research and our yeah, lives? Absolutely. I think critical reflection is needed. Mm -hmm. Very critical questions, and I, I, I don't know if Evans uh, and um, Anthea, you can tackle that, because I think you talked a lot about uh, the impact of some of the engagements and how that uh, happened, so it would be good to hear your perspectives on that question. Yes. I'm Wakefield with the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. I want to direct my questions to Graham, although I want to agree with Stefan and others who talk about the quality of this session. It's just really wonderful. Uh, Graham, you mentioned at one point the, that, they, that as one individual, one researcher, even if they are a peer, m might not be the way to both design and implement the studies. I'm wondering, how do you think we might um, capture the need for that variety when we talk about peer involvement? And then beyond that, I also am curious if you're quali since we've gone with the medicalization of HIV prevention as we roll out PrEP, um, if your quality of life measurement would have relevance and trans is translatable for people for other communities other than people living with HIV in Australia. Okay, great. So we're going to give you an opportunity to the panel to respond. Uh, but I'd like to add one question to Susan. I think you really talk, talked about the imbalance between uh, most studies being published in the developed world and in the developing world. And you made a recommendation then, therefore, that greater support should go into low-income uh, countries for that. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what makes that difference. Is it just difference in publications, or is it actually difference in doing community engagement? So that would be good. So uh, let's start uh, with Emily. Sure. Um, so I'm answering the question about how do we measure the impact about participatory research, and how um, can that help change an oppressive structure? So uh, I think starting out with an acknowledgement that we didn't measure this, that we tried to have ongoing conversations with our participants about what they wanted, what they wanted to get out of it um, in terms of final products. And um, we are still in the process of developing final products, but we've had um, participants and data collectors be co-authors on papers and on abstracts and on presentations. But that's very much rooted in the final products and, and what people think of as success in an academic context. I'm fully acknowledging that, you know? That's, that's my boxes to tick. Um, there are a lot of challenges with funding work. Um, how many USAID people are there here in the room? <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm not saying anything that you haven't heard. There are a lot of challenges with funding work that has shifting targets. And, sh and it's, the work that we did was very iterative. We continued to have conversations. We continued to build relationships. And we didn't quite know what the shape of the final products or the shape, the impact that we wanted to have until we had gotten through it. And it took us a long time to develop relationships. Um, and so the challenges, the logistical challenges that go with that in terms of in advance, you know, prospectively thinking about timelines and budgets, and that's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think learning, I've learned an incredible amount about when and how to get feedback and when and how to ask for it and when and how to practice and to prepare for that. And I have a great deal of humility um, at the end of this research. So I don't think I've done quite enough for that, and I have a colleague who may want to add something, but one, I'm realizing one of the things that I didn't talk about that was so important in this project was capacity building mm. from the scientist perspective. Mm. You know, like I think I went into it thinking one thing and I came out thinking something else. Um, and so I think that's a, an excellent question and something that needs more attention. Anybody else? You can answer the other questions. 
I can I can go. Yeah. Okay, sure. Go um, okay, so I had uh, there was two questions, and I'm not sure where the person was that asked the first one. But in terms of the question about um, how many of our of the studies included in our review actually um, turned up from using uh, the term GPP guidelines, actually we didn't use. Um, specifically good participatory practice guidelines is one of our search terms, but we use the word participatory, so we would have captured any studies that specifically used that term to describe what they were following for their community engagement, um, I guess, roadmap. Um, but I do have to say, though, <laughs> it's quite funny. So we didn't actually, you know, count or, or make a note of, you know, what articles turned up using which terms. We had a, a range of different synonyms for engagement, um, you know, community engagement, community consultation, participatory, community advisory or stakeholder but there's a lot of other terms you could potentially use too to capture the same kinds of things there's, there isn't like a standard language and I actually learned after we did the study too that in the UK there's another term called PPI um, patient and public involvement in studies and we, I didn't even know about that so we kind of missed it on that part so there's like because we don't have necessarily like a standard language for describing the same processes you know we might miss out on some of these things um, but uh, also too this is a funny thing as well some of the studies uh, that were included in our review, the entire article was all about describing in rich detail mm -hmm. the engagement practices that were used and then other studies that were included, the clinical trials, where they said, we gave a, you know, our protocol to a community advisory board, period. That was, that was the only evidence that we had about engagement in that study. And we included both. So we had this wide range of like entire articles that were all richly detailed and then some it was like one sentence. Um, so it, it, it's a, a little bit uh, different there. And then uh, Prince, your question about um, you know, engagement in lower income countries, this is a very good point. It, we, we struggle with this, was it a result, like what, what explains those findings? We limited our, um, our uh, search to English language studies. So I think that this naturally excludes a huge range of, of publications, unfortunately, um, and that, that really like, does place a limit on it there as well. Um, and yeah, the question too of, you know, is it, is it funding issues? Like, what is it? Or is it the case that people just aren't writing about it? Maybe they're doing it, but they're not writing about it, um, which is why I really, if I might use my just two seconds to really urge anybody, if there's any, you know, clinical researchers here in the room, please describe your, um, your stakeholder engagement practices, not just hiving it off into its own publication, but in the publication of your results so that we can have that information so it's not missing. Um, that would be really helpful for us. And maybe I'll, can, I can redo my review afterwards. But, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, though. And thanks to the other question as, uh, as well. Right. So, Graham, uh, do you want to tackle the G5 question? Sure. Um, I think the first question was around um, the, the points I made around uh, peer involvement or peer organisation involvement and one person not being G5. Um, I think particularly in trying to measure that, some of the things perhaps we should be looking at is a bit, the point was made a bit earlier around how much researchers have actually had their capacity built and what researchers have actually learnt. Um, I think it's quite key that um, a couple of us, it's putting the pressure on one person with HIV to, be, to somehow represent all of that input is um, at the very least unfair. Um, it's also important to recognise there are a whole lot of struggles. So for myself, um, I'll be upfront, it was not usual practice to have peer organisations as co-investigators on a study at a university. Um, that did raise eyebrows. Um, wasn't, you know, wasn't held, you know, there was no resistance, but it certainly wasn't the usual practice. Um, the, I suppose a couple of things there would be, I think, to, to allow this to happen more is, um, challenging some of the structures within our research uh, centres and institutions that value the direct involvement um, of uh, communities and the communities that are um, involved beyond consultation but as real research partners in the concept of um, there is much the study will learn um, and I think very much that idea of capacity building isn't just about capacity building communities, it's actually also about capacity building the researchers and the research centres. Um, the other point around uh, quality of life and sense of other communities and so forth, um, certainly the post-qual scale is, is quite specific to people with HIV, so there's a number of aspects in there that are quite generic, but there's also a number within the 13 items that are quite specific to HIV. Um, and it was important we wanted it to correlate with generic quality of life scales as well as specific things around stigma and so forth. Um, but as a process, I think what I'd like to argue is that um, 
I think it's actually going to be quite key, particularly as we're talking about long-term engagement and, and work that we're doing with many different communities. Um, it is a, when I started the project, I didn't think we would actually get such a short number of items that would actually be really useful. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm now quite an advocate that it can be done, it's not impossible, um, and it can be done with community. So uh, maybe we can, Anthea, I think there was okay, one question. So I'll just uh, comment on your question about, I think your question was about the setting of the research and who, we, who the participants were. Um, yeah. yeah. So the setting is a it's a peri-urban HIV prevention research centre in in South Africa. It's a community. The research centre has been in this community and part of this community for quite a long time. Um, there are all kinds of HIV prevention studies that are ongoing at the research centre. Um, it's quite a mixed community. Um, it's uh, most of the residents come uh, have migrated to the Western Cape from the Eastern Cape but also um, some immigrants from Mozambique uh, and other neighboring countries. So that makes for, for, for quite a, a mix uh, of community members in the community that often creates a lot of uh, uh, conflict. Um, uh, characteristic features of the community are very similar to many communities of that kind in South Africa. So low levels of resources, high levels of conflict, mm -hmm. many service delivery protests. There are lots of shack fires and those sorts of natural dis disasters in, in the community. Uh, in terms of the people we spoke to, uh, the participants in our research were a broad range of stakeholder groups involved in community engagement at the research center. So in this sample, we included um, some researchers at the research center. We included community outreach workers who actually implement and, are, uh, and have to go out and, and implement community engagement activities, retention office, re officers, <coughs> recruiters, counselors, um, the community liaison officer at the research center, and then also community advisory board members. So that gave us a sample of about 20 participants. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, yeah. Right. And then, yeah. then? And then to the other question, I think there was a broad question about how do we involve people uh, more broadly in the research process in terms of both uh, capacity building and acknowledgement for their work. Um, one of the things that we've done is, is, is to actually work with the community <coughs> outreach workers and the community liaison officer to become co-authors on our papers. Um, and, and one of the things that I in particular did, because um, my PhD study looked at similar issues, was to offer um, myself as a consultant and, an, and in an advisory capacity to the research center to work with a community outreach team mm -hmm. to begin to think about how they could implement these ad hoc strategies that they were using to formalize them, to expand them in terms of increasing their reach in the community um, etc. Yeah. And the thing that was quite interesting to me was that um, that was not what they wanted to focus on. They wanted me to teach them how to write. Wow. Hmm. And they wanted me to teach them how to write and how they could go about turning the work that they are doing um, into publications that they could um, wow. disseminate. Thank you very much, Anthe. I'm really sorry to cut this conversation on. It would be good to hear from Tila also some challenges around engaging parents into um, the research, but also from uh, Gail as well. How do we measure efficiency for something that is a process, not just recruitment. Uh, engagement is not just about recruitment. But unfortunately, we are running out of time, uh, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, my co-chair to conclude. I think in conclusion I have a question, and the question is from my brother at the back. I, I always have a big problem with the, with the, with the phrase um, research subjects, and, and I think it goes back to trying to change from the NIH, the Federal Code of Regulations, you know, it's all subjects, you know, uh, research subjects, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm tasking Mitchell and Emily and Manju to, you know, so that we start this engagement of changing some of these terminologies that really are relatively derogatory 
And, and so we need to engage with it more than just changing our presentation here because in all the literature, that's, that's what you get. And, and uh, the other thing is, um, uh, the other question was just about, you know, how does colonial past influence community engagement and especially with, you know, interaction with participants, interaction with those that we, we talk with uh, in terms of compensation. On the one hand, we had that the, uh, the, 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 the adolescent youth say that there should be no compensation, but on the other hand, you're looking at yourself, you're on the payroll, you're okay, mm -hmm. but you're collecting this information that's like, me, I'm a researcher, and therefore, uh, my food is coming from talking to people. Yes. I get paid for it. Yes. But now again, you know, how do we get that balance? It's something that really we need to engage with uh, at a much higher level. And, and just finally about the publications. I, I, I mean, at my age, I won't tell you how old, but I've been around. It's still difficult for me to get, um, you know, an academic paper out. Mm. I still do, and I have over 100. But it takes me like... Oh my God. And so, and, and my, my motto is never to add names because if I add your name on a publication, I'm not helping you move to the next level. I can add names, but that's not helping. So how can we support ourselves and those that are coming up to be able to put out what they work on? There's so much that we, we, people do back in the countries where we come from, but they never get disseminated because they cannot come up with the academic yeah. way of, of, of competing with those who have English as their first language, for example. I have to think in my local language, translate into Kiswahili. By the time I get to English, I've lost the meaning. Then I go back at the beginning. So I'm just looking at, it's, it's something that we really need to think about because we have lots of things that we are doing that we need to, to share, but we can't share because we don't have the capacity to be able to compete well with those who, who write well. So that's what I would say. Otherwise, an extremely important session and with extremely incisive questions. I love it. Thank you so much. Let's clap for everybody.